Welcome to Interesting People. My name is Tom Lorenzen, and I'm the host of the, of the show. It's produced here at Chabot College in Hayward, California. And today is November 22nd, 2019, and I'd just like to note at the beginning here that it was in 1963 when I was going to Chabot College as a 17-year-old kid that I learned on the way to school about the assassination of President Kennedy. Here it is many years later, and on the anniversary of that date, I just want to reference that for historical purposes. And we're also approaching Thanksgiving, and most of us have a lot to be thankful for. The premise of this show has always been that there are interesting people everywhere. One doesn't have to be famous or well-known uh, to be very interesting. And the great thing about our country, there are interesting people everywhere, which is actually noted in a book that just came out by my guest today, uh, Spencer Christian. It was 20 years ago that I was watching a program, Good Morning America show, and a news, prominent news person, person, one of the three main people on there, was bidding farewell to Good Morning America and leaving New York and coming out to San Francisco. They, uh, refer he referenced his affinity for wine. I thought, wow, this man is so nice, <laughs> and he likes wine, I like wine, and he's leaving New York to come to the San Francisco Bay Area, which is where I'm from. I never expected I ever would meet the man, and I have. In fact, I feel like I know I've known this man most of my life. And he's known many famous people. He's interviewed many famous people. Indeed, he's famous. <laughs> so. Here we are today at Chabot College, and I want to welcome to the show, Spencer thank, Christian. Thank you, Tom. Good to be with you. Nice to be here with us. Yeah. Uh, you've had a long and interesting career, and you're a young guy now because you're <laughs> a year younger than me, so yes, I know I you're younger. <laughs> and it's still evolving, and you have your book here, which just yeah. came out, You Bet Your Life, which is a fascinating book. I finished reading it last night, as you know, and thank you for the copy sure. here. Sure, absolutely. And uh, you are referred to there as the master of disaster. <laughs> and uh, yes. like all yeah. of us, we have ups and downs in our lives, yeah. and you have too. And we're going to talk about some of that later. Mm -hmm. uh, in this book, you also talk about your modest and uh, humble background and your roots. Yeah. And in this book, which I think is a truly wonderful book, you're very candid and honest about things. So let's begin our conversation, Spencer. and. Tell us about your early years living in a little town outside of Richmond, Virginia. Yeah, well, Tom, I grew up in uh, a small, poor, rural county in Virginia uh, called Charles City County, about uh, 20 miles east of Richmond and about 18 miles west of Williamsburg. So on one side, I was surrounded by colonial history, and on the other side, Civil War history. And uh, I was born in 1947, so I grew up in the era of Jim Crow racial segregation throughout the South. It was the law. Uh, that uh, blacks uh, were second-class citizens and uh, you know we couldn't go into places of public accommodation like uh, restaurants and movie theaters we couldn't attend the same schools as white kids uh, when my family went out shopping on weekends uh, my parents uh, were spending their hard-earned money uh, to get the basic essentials that any family would buy on a little weekend shopping trip but we couldn't use the same restrooms or the same water fountains as the white uh, customers. Or couldn't uh, go to the, the uh, lunch stand and order a hamburger. So this was how life was for people of color in that era, and that's how my life was for the first 20 years of my life. It wasn't until the late 1960s that those um, barriers were, were knocked down by civil rights laws. Um, and even as those barriers were going down, there was strong resistance um, uh, to, to the changes by those who wanted to continue the, the system of, of racial segregation. But as, as dehumanizing and um, uh, disturbing as, as those daily experiences were, those indignities that, that I faced every day when I left home, somehow my parents, who were remarkable people, were able to instill in my brother and me a positive, aspirational, a uh, hopeful view of life. So I remember as a kid, you know, we would have dinner in the evening and watch the, the national news on TV. And with every step forward made by the civil rights movement, my parents would, would point to that advancement as a reason to be hopeful that things were changing, that new opportunities would present themselves. And so 
their uh, ability to reinforce that hopeful attitude made me believe I could do and be anything I wanted in life. <laughs> Where were your parents from originally? Were they one from Virginia or they, elsewhere? They were from Virginia. They had they were born and raised in the same town in which I grew up, Charles right. City County, Virginia. Yeah. What do you think enabled them to see the positive despite all the negatives? What what gave them that that sense of uh, that there was good more good things happening than bad things despite the obvious bad things? Uh, that, that's a great question. I'm not sure I have the the complete answer to it, but you know uh, the foundation of our lives was our faith you know they were uh, uh, people of strong Christian faith and they instilled that faith in my brother and me and um, and you know, they would they would point to isolated experiences in their personal lives uh, that w as reasons for hope you know my my father would talk about the fact that his grandfather was born a slave but you know uh, and and how uh, once slavery ended, he was able to get a small piece of land and farm his land. And even though he wasn't given first-class citizenship, he was able to, to build a, uh, some kind of a productive life, a purposeful life for his family. And so they would tell old family stories like that. And, and even though you know every single day we faced reminders when we left the, the home, the comfort of home, that the larger society uh, <laughs> Uh, didn't uh, welcome us or embrace us or accept us, it, uh, with a few exceptions, of course. Sure. Um, there was just something about the the comfort of home and the and the family stories that inspired this positive, hopeful feeling. Now, when you started school as a young boy in the yeah. elementary school, was your school largely segregated or oh, was it integrated? Totally segregated. segregated. Yeah, completely segregated. In fact, um, the, uh, the, the typical. Um, uh, southern state uh, during the time I was growing up uh, would uh, it was uh, it was written into the law uh, something like uh, 65 percent or 75 percent of the resources for public education would go to the white schools and then the remaining 35 percent 25 to 35 percent would go to the black schools so the white schools were always uh, they always had newer uh, um, facilities uh, they had more resources they had newer textbooks uh, and the, their their actual physical uh, buildings were usually uh, uh, better maintained, mm -hmm. and and the black kids went to the you know the, the schools that weren't so well maintained. We we had textbooks that were many times uh, outdated, uh, didn't have uh, the you know the uh, resources in the in the chemistry lab that the white schools had. But what I had in my experience in my little town. Uh, was the good fortune of having had some great teachers who were really dedicated to preparing these young students, these poor black kids, uh, to be able to compete in, in, a, in a new world. So what's the first teacher that comes to mind that influenced you then? And uh, I had so many really great teachers, memorable ones, but the first one that comes to mind is Mrs. Montague. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Montague was my third and fourth grade teacher. And um, she was tough and she was strict, uh, but in a very caring way. She wasn't strict in, a, in an intimidating way. Uh, she wanted you to follow the rules and, and um, uh, she taught us not only the, the, the academics, but, but she taught us to comport ourselves um, uh, properly when we were out in the public, you know. So um, she, when she asked a question, you had to answer by saying, yes, Mrs. Montague, or no, Mrs. Montague, not just yes, ma'am, or no, ma'am. Um, but she also made the learning experience fun. You know, as strict as she was and as demanding as she was of performance, um, she, she was lively and engaging. And, and uh, for those of us who really wanted to learn, uh, it was fun being in her classroom. You know, it always amazes me as time goes on when I look back at the teachers I had to, the ones that influenced me so much. And I remember in elementary school and even here at Chabot College, I'm still very grateful and loyal to each teacher looking back that yeah. uh, gifted me. Now, you, you had rep in your book, you had referenced a uh, Mr. Johnson, oh. too. Mr. Johnson might have been the greatest <laughs> teacher I had of all the, the, the uh, terrific teachers I had. He was a seventh grade teacher, and he was the first male teacher I had a, in grade school. And remember, in grade school, well, in those days, I don't know how it is now, uh, one teacher taught all the subjects. So he mm -hmm. taught, you know, English, math, science, social studies, history, um, and, and yet he seemed to be a master of all those subjects. And, um, 
and as as the first male teacher, uh, I think a lot of a lot of the kids, as we were looking forward to going to Mrs. Johnson's class, weren't sure what to expect because um, you know he was a we he was kind of a muscular, strapping-looking guy. We knew he had been in the Navy or the Marines. Uh, he had a tattoo, <laughs> <All right. laughs> which was kind of unusual back uh -huh. in those days. Yeah. And um, I think a lot of kids felt intimidated before they even got to know Mr. Johnson. But once you got in the classroom. Uh, we discovered he was much like Mrs. Montague in that he was tough and demanding and insisted on you know a certain level of performance but uh, even more than Mrs. Montague was entertaining Mr. Johnson was entertaining he liked to um, do plays on words and puns which I think is probably where I began uh, <laughs> <laughs> doing puns and he would he, he when he sensed that um, the mood was getting a little gloomy in the classroom. He would do something to make us laugh and wake us up and, you know, get our uh, attention. Uh, and then he would insist that we learn something. So he was, he was quite a character. And one other teacher that you referenced in your book, Mrs. Jefferson. Uh, Mrs. Jefferson um, was my homeroom teacher in the eighth grade, but she also was my Algebra one teacher in the eighth grade, and she was my Geometry teacher in the tenth grade. Um, she was, uh, you know, she was a lot like a female version of Mr. Johnson. <laughs> uh, she, she was lively uh, and engaging, had a great, a wicked sense of humor. Um, and she was as passionate about uh, mathematics as, as a teacher could be. She, I remember her saying to us that uh, algebra and geometry and, and most of the mathematics courses uh, were almost like languages. Uh, she said they're like universal languages. She said no matter what, l what verbal language you speak, uh, we all study the same mathematical concepts. And, um, and I, th that struck me in as something interesting, you know, that, that uh, m math was sort of the, the common universal language. She also, Mrs. Jefferson also liked um, uh, those movie star magazines. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so, um, she was really into uh, the movies, and so every once in a while I would take one of those magazines into the classroom, and after class, she and I would sit there and read about the, the stars of the day. So we kind of bonded and had a little student-teacher uh, friendship. Now, I never thought about it, but we're the, Brown, versus, Brown versus Board of Education was 1954, and then eventually schools were being integrated. Were all the teachers at your school African American then, or did you have any Caucasian teachers? No, or, it was all, 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 African. all African American teachers, all African American students. Um, the superintendent of schools for our county was white, of course, because there were no black superintendents in those days. Uh, we're talking now about the, the 50s and 60s when yeah. I was in grade school. Um, and I graduated from high school in 1965. The following year, the following, following two years, 66 and 67, were the years when the schools in my county began to integrate. Um, and strangely enough, uh, in my county, uh, the experience was different from the typical Southern experience, typically across the South, because as I described earlier, the white schools got more funding and, and better resources. When they integrated the school systems, the, the school that had been the white school would become the, the primary high school, and the school that had been the black high school would become the, the, the uh, middle school. But in my county, the, uh, the black population was larger than the white population, so the, the, our school, even though our school building wasn't as new as what had been the, the white school, it was a larger facility, could accommodate more students, and that became the high school, the integrated high school. Yeah. In interesting, and uh, you know, here you've, you went on, did you have a sense that you would go on to college and go on at all to the type of life? Because you're a national figure. You've been known nationally and even internationally, and these teachers, yeah. it's interesting to hear you say how much they impacted you oh, in, your, yeah. in your life. It's Huge impact. Well, the, I, I guess the first influence in me was, of course, parental influence, my parents, uh, and the, the direction they gave me in life and the, the positive feedback they gave me that reinforced this belief that I could, or I, I should say, that planted the seed of the belief that I could do whatever I wanted to do. But then the positive feedback I got from these amazing teachers encouraged me to, to want to, to be an achiever. Um, so there, even though both of my parents had very limited formal education, I mean, they were very wise and intelligent people, but neither of them had the opportunity to, to even get a high school diploma mm -hmm. because they were from large, poor families and they had to uh, drop out of school during the Depression to go to work to help uh, support their siblings. Uh, they taught me to read when I was about four years old, and they encouraged me to be 
curious, to have intellectual curiosity. So there never was a time in my childhood when I doubted I was going to go on to college. Well, Spencer, with that, we've laid the foundation in the first segment here to go to the next segment. We're going to take a brief pause for a public service announcement, and then we're going to go into your early career in journalism okay. and TV news. What to expect when you're expecting? Like here? A teenager. Today, I'm going to show you how to teen-proof your home. First step, hide the car keys. Preferably somewhere they would never look. Challenges will come up. Be ready for them. Hi, honey. Ready for the- Mom, you don't use mannequins in the mannequin challenge. You don't have to know it all to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. <laughs> Welcome back to Interesting People with my special guest today, Mr. Spencer Christian. We were talking earlier, Spencer, about your growing up in a town just outside of Richmond, Virginia, and your experiences, education, plus dealing with Jim Crow. Now we're moving on to your incredible career you've had. You ended up going to Hampton College, and you got interested in journalism. What brought that about? Well, I was in, in college, Tom, in the late 1960s, which you may recall was a time of <laughs> yeah, <laughs> upheaval. I recall, yeah. and, <laughs> but you do. A uh, time of rather profound social and political change in the country. And I was, uh, I worked in um, some political campaigns myself as a student in the late 60s. It was a time of uh, widespread student activism. And I was so fascinated by the way the news media covered the events of that era, you know, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, uh, the Vietnam War and the anti-war protests. I decided, you know, I think I want to be a journalist. So I majored in English because I always loved the language and I loved literature and I minored in journalism. And uh, out of college, I pursued a career. I, well, I was pursuing a career as a print journalist. Mm -hmm. I had no thoughts about broadcasting when I was in college, believe it or not. Now here I am having been in broadcasting for 48 years. Uh, but my first opportunity, um, uh, job opportunity as a news reporter happened to be at the NBC television station in Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy. <laughs> and I was uh, the third person of color to be hired uh, uh, t uh, on a local news uh, station in Richmond. Uh, that was 1971. And from that point, my career uh, just sort of took off and I ended up uh, it, within a few short years in New York at WABC TV and then on to Good Morning America. So you, you originally though, you were gonna cover general news and political news oh, in Richmond? That's right. Well, how did you, because you're noted f for your weather, I know you've that's done many, how did you end up moving into doing weather in Richmond? Uh, it's, uh, I, I have to chuckle to myself when I think about how that happened. I had been on the air doing uh, news for about uh, almost two years. So still the early 1970s, late 1972. Um, one day the news director at our station, who was a lot like the Lou Grant character in the old Mary Tyler Moore show, came bursting into the newsroom in a bit of a panic because our longtime weatherman had quit unexpectedly and he needed someone to fill in on weather, and he chose me. And the reason he chose me was that I had done a lot of science reporting, which okay. said to him that I understood enough about the mm -hmm. way the atmosphere works that I could talk knowledgeably about weather, even though I wasn't a trained meteorologist sure. at that time. So I filled in for two weeks on the weather, uh, enjoyed it, um, you know, brought a little humor to it, and at the end of my two weeks of filling in, the general manager of the station called me into his office and he said, you've become a hit, our ratings have gone up, we'd like you to be our full-time weatherman. And I said, oh, no, no, I'm a, I'm a journalist, I do news. <laughs> and he said, we could almost double your salary. I said, I'm a weatherman. <laughs> <laughs> and that's literally how it started. Money like, does talk, it right? Does, it does, it <laughs> and I, after, I was a capitalist after all. <laughs> so uh, once I uh, assumed that new role, I was in a more visible role on, on the newscast mm -hmm. than your typical reporter who's out in the field every day. Uh, and I was able to, to you know, uh, interact with the anchors and, uh, and reveal some personality. Um, and that allowed me to become well-known very quickly. And then I started getting offers from stations in larger markets. And that, of course, led to my going up, moving up to New York. Hi, I'm Fast Betty, and now your host for Good Morning New York, Spencer Christian and Andrea Clarence. Good morning, New York. Well, you've got an awful lot of energy for Monday, and we're going to start off this week by taking you on your own personal guided tour. The reason I look a little bit lonely here is that Spencer is on that tour. He's getting ready to take us 
he is at the set of One Life to Live. And if you happen to be a soap opera fan, you probably wonder what goes on behind the scenes. Is it in a house or is it in a studio? How long does it take for the actors to get ready? So right now, we're going to spend a little bit of time on Good Morning New York with our own personal tour of One Life to Live. Good morning, Spence. Oh, good morning, Andrea. How are you? I'm just uh, checking out the latest news in Landview, in the Landview newspaper, the uh, banner. And as you can see here in this headline, Tina Clayton is missing. You know who Tina Clayton is if you watch One Life to Live, and many people do. It's certainly one of the most popular daytime serials in television. And today we're going behind the scenes. We're going to meet such stars of One Life to Live as Dr. Larry Wolek, Pat Ashley, Dorian Lord. Our tour guide is going to be none other than Joe Stewart, who's the producer and the boss of One Life to Live. Right now, I'm standing in the locker room of the bus station in Landview. And in just a moment, Good Morning New York will go behind the scenes at One Life to Live. So you stay with us. We'll be right back. And by the time I got on to um, Good Morning America, I had been a news reporter. I had briefly been the, the main sportscaster at WABC in New York. And of course, I had done weather. So when Good Morning America uh, brought me onto the show full time in the mid 1980s uh, as weathercaster, uh, it was made clear to me that by the management that um, because I had such a wide range of interests, I could pursue any kind of reporting I wanted in addition to doing weather. So I, I filled in as host. Um, I interviewed political figures, entertainers, sports figures. Uh, I was uh, on assignments that took me to 50, all 50 states and five continents, but I also did weather every day. And uh, I was sent out for uh, hurricane coverage and floods and blizzards and all those natural disasters, which is when I started uh, calling myself the master of disaster. <laughs> <laughs> we, when we were talking earlier, uh, Spencer, about Willard Scott and Al Roker and yourself, uh, weather became uh, something that was also a form of entertainment. They made listening to the weather, fun. Yeah, and that's right. And the three of you guys were the key founders, I think, of making weather really interesting and fun to watch. Uh, was that just something that came about or? Uh... I, I think it's something that just naturally evolved. Uh, for, for some reason, I think in the early days of TV, um, go back to the 1960s, I guess, that's when the when television became very local, TV news especially became very popular. Um, the people who did weather tended to be people who um, weren't reporting on, well, we weren't reporting on uh, devastating, uh, 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 disturbing uh, topics every day, uh, only when the weather was severe. So on a typical weather day, when the weather was boring, in order to hold people's attention, we had to try to be entertaining. Um, and so I think some of us were just naturally uh, humorous or, or uh, like to have a, a chuckle. And uh, at least, I know in my case, when I first started doing weather, I'd like to try to make the, the anchors chuckle a uh -huh. little bit. Um, so I, I think it, it, it was a role in which, uh, a, a role that just sort of naturally evolved into a role for people who tended to be a little bit looser and more entertaining than your stiff anchor man. Yeah, well I think uh, all three uh, of you were. Al Roker <laughs> and Word Scott, you, you, you have great personalities, you made it fun, you made it interesting, you had humor, and yeah. we all watched the weather. And, yeah, uh, and, 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 and I think uh, market research shows that, or audience research, shows that um, most viewers are more interested in weather than they are in any other single topic in a newscast, because weather right, affects yeah. Sure. Everybody's lives, yeah. Well, there was a TV series back in the 50s called Have Gun Will Travel. When I think of you, I made a note, Have Storm Will Travel. <laughs> so if there was a storm somewhere, a hurricane or somewhere, you would go and cover that story. And it was, I was the guy. You were the paladin of weather. The paladin, yeah, paladin <laughs> of Have Gun Will Travel, yeah. Uh, have Storm Will Travel. And, and so during my, my years at Good Morning America, uh, when I was there full time from 86 to 99, uh, whenever there was a major weather event, I was sent out to that location. So. Uh, I reported live from about 14 hurricanes, massive floods, blizzards, uh, all, all types of natural disasters, even earthquakes, which are not weather related, yeah. <laughs> but because they are natural calamities, sure. I was sent out to cover those. Uh, and I think I was probably, probably the first national TV news reporter to be out in those hurricanes, uh, in, in those uh, locations where the hurricanes came on shore. And you, you know, you'd see me occasionally holding on to a utility pole with one arm. Yes, and holding I remember. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we are in the San Francisco Bay Area, so uh, we shouldn't really be talking about earthquakes. We <laughs> <want to. laughs> That's true. That's true. I, 
Go ahead, Spencer. Go, I was just going to say, I, I happen to have been here in the Bay Area for the 1989 World Series. Yeah. I was on a World Series assignment for Good Morning America when the Loma Prieta earthquake occurred, uh -huh. which was terrifying. And I remember I had such earthquake anxiety mm -hmm. uh, after that experience. I thought, I could never live in a place like this. <laughs> and 10 years after that, I moved here. <laughs> Well, during your uh, 12 years, right, you were at Good Morning America, 12? Yes. Oh, yeah, 12 and a half years. Yeah, mm -hmm. that you interviewed, you met all kinds oh. of famous, fascinating people. Yeah. But in your book, you also have about, you enjoyed talking to ordinary people who did extraordinary things, which is what I like to do on this show, yeah. is to interview people that are not known, but you're obviously known, and we've done some well-known people on this show. You met a number of presidents, and mm -hmm. one of I want to ask you some questions as we go sure, through. Sure. Now, one of them intrigued me, that you had a conversation with Richard Nixon and you <laughs> made him laugh. Yes. How did you do that? Well, you know, Richard Nixon was not known for uh, his humor. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a pretty, pretty serious guy. Um, and I had, uh, whenever anyone of that stature was going to be on the program, I would want to go into the green room and engage them in conversation if I was not going to be part of the interview, because I just like meeting people like that. So when I uh, discovered that Richard Nixon was going to be on Good Morning America and I was not going to be a part of that segment, I thought, well, I've met a couple of other presidents. I want to go in and chat with Nixon so I can add another notch <laughs> to my belt. So I walked into the green room. I, I introduced myself to him. I, Good morning, Mr. President. I'm, and before I could get my name out, he said, oh, I know who you are. <laughs> and, and he shook my hand like that. And I knew that he loved baseball. So I started talking to him about baseball, about the New York Mets and how they were doing. And as the conversation went on, I saw that he felt comfortable with me and he was beginning to, to loosen up. So I decided to tell him a story that was a true story, but it, it poked a little fun at him. And I said, uh, Mr. President, in 1960, when you ran against John Kennedy for president, uh, I was in the eighth grade and our civics teacher chose two students to do a mock presidential debate. I was Richard Nixon and the other kid was John Kennedy. I won the debate and you lost the election. <laughs> and he went, oh, oh. <laughs> So I thought, wow, I made Richard Nixon laugh. That's quite an achievement. <laughs> you yeah. you got to be noted for that. <laughs> then you had a chance to visit uh, for a little bit with President Ford, who replaced President Nixon. That's exactly right. Um, uh, so President Ford, uh, this was after his presidency, was a guest in, on GMA. And once again, I decided to go to the green room and, and chat him up. So I, I walked in there. And before I could get a word out of my mouth, he popped up out of his seat. He said, Spencer, Betty and I watch you every day. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, a former president. He watches me every day. And so we had a, a little lively conversation there. Well, too. I think there's a line that could be yeah. created, Spencer, presidents who have watched Spencer Christian. <laughs> <laughs> That's I think my, it's next, a, my next book. <laughs> a whole group of people there. And then uh, uh, President Carter, I know oh, you've got a chance yes. to have gotten to know him and his wife, uh, Rosalind, over the years. Yes, yes. I developed, a, I guess you could call it a friendship with President Carter. Um, I actually, before I met President Carter, Jimmy Carter, I met his younger brother, um, who's now deceased, uh, Billy Carter, who was, mm -hmm. as you know, quite a, uh, a notorious character. character yes. yeah. <laughs> and so um, Billy Carter was, was widely made fun of by people in the media. Uh, there were a lot of you know, just really horrible jokes about him. And so, but when I met Billy Carter and, and his wife Sybil and interviewed them around 1980, um, I, I tried to, you know, I, I treated them respectfully. Sure. So eight years later, 1988, uh, I was on the grounds of the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library doing an interview, preparing for an interview with President Jimmy Carter. And uh, he came up to me uh, before the interview as cameraman and I were setting up, and he thanked me uh, on behalf of the Carter family for not trying to rob Billy Carter of his dignity. When uh, I interviewed very him. nice. And I was deeply touched by that. So I did the interview with, with President Carter, and then uh, about a year or so later, uh, the Carters, uh, President and Mrs. Carter, invited me to work with them on Habitat for Humanity. And I did my Good Morning America segments at the site of the, the house that they were building, uh, and continued to have interaction with the Carters over the years. And then when I moved here to the Bay Area in 1999, Jimmy Carter was turning 75, and the Carter family invited me to America's Georgia to MC his 75th birthday celebration. And um, uh, our relationship uh, continued, and uh, this year uh, I was invited to America's Georgia to MC President Carter's 95th wow. uh, birthday celebration. So uh, we have developed a bit of a relationship. 
And you've met other presidents too, but let's just go to President Obama. Ah, so I met uh, Senator Obama. Senator Obama, in, okay. uh, in November of 2006, which was about three months before he announced his candidacy. Mm -hmm. And of course, everyone knew that he was going to run for president, but he was being a bit coy about it as he was on his book tour, the book, um, the, the Audacity of Hope. Um, so I did an interview with him at the, in the KGO ABC7 studios in, in uh, November 2006. And he, uh, he's, he was just such a, an engaging, charismatic um, figure, just, just a, a memorable person, yeah. Because uh, we have to move on fast here, but I want Bill Murray. Uh, you uh, did weather duets, and I understand you had some influence upon him in Groundhog Day or yes. something. Yes. Well, movie. many of the prominent people who came through the Good Morning America studio would watch me standing in front of the blank green screen doing weather, and uh, lots of them wanted to, um, to to try their hand at it. So uh, Bill Murray was one of those. He was in the studio and asked me if he could do the weather with me. I said sure. So we did a weather duet. Uh, and we were in front of the green screen and I would describe what was happening with weather and he would try to find the right place to point, you know, with his, with his hand to make <laughs> it look, look like he, he knew what he was doing. And a year later he made the movie Groundhog Day in which he played a weatherman. Yeah. And um, when he was out promoting that film, he was on the Today Show, which was our competition. And Willard Scott asked him, uh, Bill, when you were preparing, for this role, which national weatherman did you pattern your character after? And he said, Spencer Christian. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And uh, in these weather duets, and we're going to take a short break, but I do want to note that another person who did a weather duet with you is a graduate of Chippewa College here, and that's Tom Hanks. That's right. And I'm, uh, he and I both serve on the National Advisory Committee, the Eisenhower Memorial Commission, and looking forward to hopefully meeting him in the next few months when we dedicate the memorial there. But I want to note, because this is Chippewa College, and this is where Tom Hanks also went, probably the most yeah. famous uh, graduate of the station. And now we're gonna take a brief pause for a public service announcement and come back for our continuing discussion with Spencer Christian. When I was in foster care, I never knew when I would have to move. So I always had my suitcase ready to go. Then one day I was adopted. My new parents opened their hearts and home to me. My parents cooked my favorite breakfast for me every morning. My parents take me on trips I never thought I would go on. They gave me a home and an even better reason to use that suitcase. My parents aren't perfect, but they're perfect for me. Welcome back to Interesting People with my guest today, Spencer Christian. As Spencer and I have talked, we have a lot in common. I say, even though we've only recently met, I think I've known you my whole life. <laughs> and one of the things that we found out when we had coffee just a week or so ago I was born in Brooklyn. I referenced my passion for the Brooklyn Dodgers right. and that my fate, and I was there in the summers to 55, 56 as a kid. And you said those were your favorite seasons and your favorite team, the Brooklyn Dodgers as well. That's right. And you shared that you had a hero on the Dodgers. Now tell me who that hero was. That hero was Duke Snyder, who played center field and, and back in the days of the Brooklyn Dodgers, uh, the, the three New York teams, Yankees, Gi Giants, and Dodgers, had the three greatest center fielders yes. in baseball, Mays, Mantle, and Snyder. So um, I grew up collecting baseball cards and following the Dodgers. And I, actually, I must confess, I'm still a Dodger fan. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in around 1990, 91, somewhere around there, Duke Snyder, who uh, at that point, of course, was long past his baseball playing days, was a guest in Good Morning America. He was talking about um, how many of the athletes from his uh, generation uh, would attend these memorabilia shows and sign baseballs and sign uh, uh, pictures. That was their way of earning some money. And um, I decided I had to go to the green room and meet him before the, the uh, program because he was my childhood hero. So I, I walked into the <coughs> green room to introduce myself to Duke Snyder. And, and much like uh, the Gerald Ford story I told earlier, mm -hmm. Duke Snyder popped up out of his seat and said, Spencer, you're my favorite. I wanted to, I was looking forward to meeting you. <laughs> and I was so deeply touched that my childhood hero even knew who I was, much less was a fan of mine, and I wept. <laughs> I actually had tears rolling down my cheeks. So he and I had a, a bit, of, bit of a chat there and he gave me a big old bear hug and it was just a great experience. That's fascinating. As we talked, I had a chance to meet Roy Campanella and Jackie Robinson and Duke Snyder. Oh, yeah. And I had a chance to have a conversation with Roy Campanella in his wheelchair. And I told him what a hero he was. He was my hero on the Dodgers. And we were at the White House and President Reagan was standing by and he said, well, there's the president. He's a hero. And 
And I said, no, Mr. Campanella, to a kid like me, yeah. he's the president, but you are a real hero to kids like me. Yeah. And Campy started to cry. That's awesome. And uh, yeah. it was a very touching story. We're gonna move into a, uh, another aspect here that's very important about you, uh, Spencer. And I'm gonna say something first. In a former uh, life, I was the senior federal health official in the Western states. And I was giving a talk to uh, uh, a group of Native Americans down in Arizona. It was an annual conference and 300 people or so. I went to a small uh, conference room and they had four young girls talking there. I was so touched by what they were, they were, they were only 18, 19 years and they had a methamphetamine problem and they were, had gotten over it and trying to move on with their lives. I had a speech to deliver, I put it down and then I spoke from the heart. At the time I had a dear family member dealing with uh, alcoholism and, uh, and I also had an addiction which I acknowledge <laughs> it sounds funny but it did sadly contribute to me having open heart surgery, I was addicted to cookies and I used to gorge myself, I was an addict. Yeah. And for 30 years I was an addict. I went cold turkey finally, but it did contribute to open heart surgery. In your book here, again, you bet your life, you uh, talk about your own addiction. And I, in reading this book, I thought it was extremely touching because it resonates with, I think, most families all around the country and world about addiction problems, the troubles we go through in life. Uh, you had a 30-year addiction problem, yep. and, uh, and you worked your way through it. How did it start? It was gambling addiction. Gambling it started addiction. in the late 1970s, Tom, when <coughs> casino gambling first came to Atlantic City, New Jersey, which is not far from New York. And um, I had been playing in a, in a Friday night poker game after the Friday night at the, after the late news with a few of the guys there in New York at WABC. Um, Seemed, it started as just sort of an innocent game. You know, you might be able to win or lose a couple hundred bucks on a Friday night, and that was it. But it, it quickly evolved into um, more of a cutthroat game, a higher stakes game. And then I, and I heard all these guys uh, who played poker talking about Las Vegas and casinos, and uh, I, I had never been to Las Vegas. So when casino gambling came to Atlantic City in 1978, I couldn't wait to get down there and see what that casino experience was like. And from the moment I first walked into a casino, I think I was hooked on that that feeling, of, that electric feeling. Of I, I something know. exciting could happen here. Um, and I, I learned to play blackjack and I learned to play craps. And uh, to make a long story a little bit shorter, within just a few years, I had uh, moved up and up and up uh, to higher levels of, of, excuse me, higher levels of gambling where I was uh, gambling for higher stakes and getting the VIP treatment where they give you a complimentary you know, luxury suite and uh, meals at the at the gourmet restaurants, and you can bring your family, and you know they they pay everybody's expenses, um, and so I very quickly uh, fell into the grips of this this gambling thing, and during the first few years, I I, I knew I was sinking into uh, compulsive behavior, uh, and I was going broke too. I was mm -hmm. losing a lot of money. Um, I was in denial, of course. I I tried to. Uh, justify what I was doing by calling it expensive recreation. But I knew that because of the amount of money I was losing and the fact that I was having all these financial problems that it was really an addiction. Um, and then once I began to, to admit that to myself, I had this feeling of shame and, and guilt. I didn't want other people to know that uh, a smart guy could make such foolish choices in life. So. As the years went by, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, uh, I was constantly uh, juggling my finances, trying to cover my gambling losses. I went through uh, a bankruptcy in the 1980s, lost my home to the IRS because I'd fallen behind in federal income taxes. Uh, but because my earnings were high, I was always able to borrow money somewhere, get, take out an extra mortgage on the house or take out an extra credit line here and there. Then I moved to the Bay Area in uh, 1999 uh, and uh, experienced a sharp reduction in my income coming from a network job to a mm -hmm. local station. I was going through a, a costly divorce and I was behind on federal income taxes again. I eventually went through a second bankruptcy, uh, which didn't get rid of all of my consumer debt. It only got rid of my casino credit line debt. Uh, but it gave me a chance to, to not only get back on my feet, but it, it shocked me into thinking about what I was doing with my life. You know, uh, how, how could I get out of this, this uh, downward spiral I was in? 
um, uh, the guilt and the shame were still there. And by the way, I mentioned earlier about being a person of faith. Now I've been a person of faith all my life, and I, you know, I, I pray and I practice my faith, and I, I you know, feel a, God's presence in my life. And yet, here I am, engaged in this wasteful mm -hmm. um, behavior, this self-destructive behavior. So, around uh, 2011 or 12, my daughter Jessica uh, was uh, getting engaged. Um, and she came out here to visit me, and my kids had, in their early life, in, in their childhood, had, uh, you know, gone with my wife and me on all the family vacations that would ultimately end, uh, ultimately involve a stop in Las Vegas for a few days. Um, but they had reached a point in their teenage years where they began to realize that Dad had a problem. So my daughter Jessica comes out here to visit me in about 2012 to talk about getting engaged, and she said, Dad. Uh, there's so many things about you that, that I love and admire and respect, but I'm really worried about this destructive path you're on with the gambling. She said, I, I hope you'll ask yourself, um, is this the behavior you want to model for your grandchildren when I bring grandchildren into your life? Uh, is this the way you want to be remembered? She said, you know, if you were to, to drop dead in the casino, do you think people would remember those wonderful things about you that I, that I love and admire, or will they remember that you 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 know, just basically threw your life away in this destructive uh, pattern of gambling. And, you know, people of faith often talk about uh, a, a, an awakening. They call it a come to Jesus moment. I had a come to Jessica moment. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was my wake up call. And I knew at that moment that I didn't want gambling to be a part of my life when grandchildren were born. I didn't want it to be a part of my life at all, period. And uh, that was the moment I began to to turn around and, and gambling was no longer appealing to me, it was no longer fun, uh, it had brought too much stress and pain into my life, and I decided to tell my story uh, in this book. Uh, as I was writing the book, it was a cathartic experience. I felt like this weight of this guilt and shame had been lifted from me, and um, apart from that uh, selfish purpose it served, I hoped that my story would serve as a, as a model a source of inspiration and encouragement to other people facing any kind of difficulty that has caused them pain and shame and guilt. I think you've done a tremendous thing, Spencer, and I might have referenced that uh, I spent a good portion of my life in Nevada. I worked my way through graduate school, actually, as a dealer in a casino. Uh, I took my time going through graduate school, by the way. It took a long time, <laughs> but I, I did finish. And I witnessed the addiction uh, problem uh, face to face from people on the other side of the tables. Later, actually Frank Ferenkoff, who became my boss and later mm -hmm. the first president and CEO of the American Gaming Association, uh, did a wonderful thing, I feel, and that was to get the gaming industry to acknowledge that there is an addiction problem and they did establish an institute and funding was put up to study the problem of addiction to uh, gambling. And it was an important thing uh, that the industry did and that Mr. Ferenkoff did to make that happen. And uh, and as a reference, you know, I, in prior shows, I had a good friend on here, Sig Siegel, who is now the longest serving opera singer in the chorus San Francisco Opera. And he dealt with serious mental health issues. He was an institution and he openly, including on this TV show, talks about how he sang his way out of the institution. Mm. And now he's the longest serving, I believe, member of the chorus in San Francisco for 40 years. And uh, so I think it's exceptional that you are sharing the story for other people to learn and to recognize because addiction is such a common problem, whether it's alcohol, tobacco, gambling, whatever it may be, we're all vulnerable to it. We, we certainly are. And, and, I, and I, I want people uh, to know as I share my story, whether they read the book or hear, just hear me talk about it on a show like this, that um, no matter what your station in life, whether you're, you know, uh, everyday person who's not known publicly or someone in the public eye like I am. We all have these these human frailties. We all have problems. Uh, and I, you know, you can watch someone on the TV who, uh, like me, appears to be happy-go-lucky guy and you might get the impression that, oh, this guy must have the perfect life. Everything must be great in his life. No, everything is not great in anyone's life. We That's all right. ha have problems and difficulties and fears and failures. And, um, and I'm pleased that I've found the courage to share mine, and I hope that it's, uh, it's uh, encouraging to, to others. I think it's a tremendous thing you've done, and uh, 
Uh, before we take uh, another break, uh, I'm going to go back to uh, among the many famous people you dealt with, Muhammad Ali. Uh, what was he like? You spent some time with him. As oh, I, I loved Ali. We, had, we became pretty good friends. I first met Muhammad Ali in 1980, when he, before his physical decline really became mm -hmm. apparent. And he was still sharp and, and witty and clever. Um, and uh, he was married at that time to uh, a woman named Veronica Porsche, who had been a fashion model, beautiful, beautiful lady. And she had been a guest on the show, uh, interview show I was doing in New York for ABC. And every time she, she, would, she would come on the show regularly, as a matter of fact, to talk about beauty and fashion tips. And every time she'd come to the show, Ali would come with her because even though he was known for being, well, politely a womanizer, um, he was jealous of his wife. <laughs> so so uh, he invited me to join them for lunch one day. This is how our friendship began. And he playfully waved his fist under my nose. <laughs> and he said, uh, I can't let you hang out with my wife too much because you're one of them pretty boys. <laughs> <laughs> and so we joked about that. And yeah. then he started to describe to me how he was a prisoner of his own celebrity. Uh -huh. He asked me if I ever took my kids to Disney World. I said, yeah, of course. And he said, you take your kids out to the local park to play ball? I said, oh, yeah, all the time. And he said, how about to the movies? I said, sure, sure. He said, you know, I can't do any of that because the moment he walks out of a door, you know, everybody was just on him. And he said, uh, I, have to, I have to pay for privacy. He said, I have to rent out a theater to take my family to a movie or rent out a, a, a park to take my kids and play. Uh, and I thought, wow, what, you know, he, he loved people and he certainly enjoyed the attention, but he was a prisoner of his own celebrity. So we um, kept in touch over the years and uh, we'd meet up at um, uh, sports events, sports memorabilia events or celebrity VIP parties mm -hmm. at the casinos in Atlantic City. Sure, yeah. uh, and as the years went by and you could see his physical decline, um, he would, uh, as, soon as, as soon as he would see me in the crowd, there would be a gleam in his eye. He'd come over and give me a big hug, and he'd say, "You're still pretty." <laughs> <laughs> so, in my final day, my final day at Good Morning America during that uh, tribute show that yeah. you said you watched, um, the the last gift that uh, my colleagues gave me was a portrait of Ali that they unveiled there at the last moment that he had signed. And you remember throughout his career, he always said, I am the greatest. Right, right. But on that portrait, he wrote to Spencer, you're the greatest. And oh, it just uh, touched me so deeply. And once again, I broke down and cried <laughs> right there on well, well, we, national full, TV. Well, I understand that, Spencer. I'm a guy that can cry, too. So yeah. <laughs> now we're going to take a brief pause again and uh, for a public service announcement. And then we're going to come back for the final segment of this interview with Spencer Christian. Jordan knows he shouldn't eat this entire bowl of nachos, but tonight he's earned that right. Because a few hours ago in the middle of happy hour, he recognized a sign. Not from the gods or a bolt of lightning, but from a double heart, a kissy face, and a fourth ha in ha ha ha. That's when Jordan knew he was buzzed. So when it was time to go, he got a ride home instead of driving. Be a legend like Jordan. Recognize your buzz warning signs and get a ride home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. Welcome back to Interesting People uh, with my guest, Spencer Christian. Spencer, you're a wine aficionado, <laughs> and I like wine, uh, but you're a real expert. In what, how did you get interested in wine? And tell us about your fascination and your knowledge of the whole wine world. And you've had a TV show you've done on this, too, I believe. That's true. That's true. Well, what do 85 restaurants, 200 food items, and 46 wineries have in common? Outside the Lands Music Festival in historic Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, of course. Let's go in and find out how a music festival has reshaped the whole food and wine experience. Well, my, uh, my love affair with wine began um, in late 1976. Um, my wife and I had taken a friend out to celebrate his engagement. And at that point, I didn't have a particular curiosity, curiosity about wine. and certainly didn't have much knowledge about wine. But I decided for this festive occasion, I was going to uh, order the most expensive bottle of wine on the wine list at this restaurant. And I looked at the list, and the most expensive bottle was a 1966 vintage Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, which is one of the most ouch. sought after. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, ouch is right. <laughs> uh, now, at that time, uh, 1976, that bottle uh, cost just under $100. Uh, but that was a lot of lot of money. That, sure, a lot sure, of money. Sure. That. that was a, about like a four hundred dollar bottle now. Uh, and from the moment that 
wine was poured in the glass, the, the bouquet lifted out, and I was pulled in like the, like the cartoon character, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I tasted that wine, and it, just, it was just unlike anything I'd ever uh, tasted. So I was hooked right away, and I just went out, and my, my curiosity was piqued. So I bought books on wine, and started reading about different varietals and wine, different wine-growing regions around the world, and started buying and tasting and sampling wines uh, of different types. And within about two years from that, that wine experience, I had built a cellar in my home and I uh, had amassed, a, uh, had accumulated about 1,500, 1,600 bottles. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot. It, you know, in this last seg segment, uh, Spencer, we're gonna extract from you some of the things you've learned about what's important in life for yourself, but also for other people and advice. But we're going to go back just briefly because of your own experience with uh, having an addiction. And it's so common. I mean, we all vulnerable. I had a cook, cookie addiction that led to heart surgery. Uh, and what advice do you give to people that are l l watching this show and listening to? What advice do you have when you have an addiction problem do you give to people, regardless of what it is? Well, I, I guess the first thing is I would, I would encourage people with any kind of addiction to try to find the courage, it does take courage, but try to find the courage to admit that you have a problem and that you need help, and then seek help. Uh, I, I was fortunate, I, di I, wasn't, I didn't have to go into a 12-step program or anything mm -hmm. like that. Uh, I think everyone's experience with recovery from addiction is, is different, but I highly recommend you know, counseling, uh, therapy sessions, group sessions, or, or individual sessions. Uh, but th the first step is just acknowledging I have a problem, this is truly an addiction, I can't kick it on my own, I need help. So that's the first step. And then the second step is going to someone you feel comfortable opening up to, whether it be a, a close friend, a family member. I, my, from my experience, most addicts don't want to open up to a, a close friend or a family right. member. They find it easier to open up to a stranger, and, and very often that stranger is a counselor or a therapist or a clergy person. Um, so I, I would encourage that. Uh, but once you get past those first couple of steps of uh, finding the courage to acknowledge the problem and seek help, I think the rest of it just kind of falls into place. Uh, at least it did for me. Uh, I began to uh, feel that, as my daughter Jessica said, I was living a more purposeful life. Um, I found other things to consume my time besides spending all night in a casino. Uh, I, have, I have a wide range of interests in life, so it was easy for me to find other pursuits. Uh, I started going to the gym more regularly. I started reading more. Um, I started visiting wineries more often. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that first step is, is the toughest one. Just it, it takes a lot of courage to acknowledge I have a problem, but that's, right. you don't make that step, you're not gonna beat it. I understand that. I have a dear family member who's passed now who, uh, was an alcoholic. It took a long time to get there, and when he shared it with me, he was embarrassed, and I said, do not be. I'm no. very proud of you, because I know the courage that it took to say, I'm an alcoholic, and, sure. and, I, and it increased my respect for my own family member and my love for him, so I know the tremendous courage it takes. And sure. uh, you're Looking back on uh, your whole life, what what lessons do you feel you've learned going back to your childhood with your parents, your, your, your career you've had? What, what, what things have you learned that uh, are worth sharing? Well, you know, um, my parents uh, somehow taught me without saying it in these words that uh, I should try to find some commonality with everyone I meet in life. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always from early childhood been kind of an outgoing people person. Sure. Uh, and um, the, the more um, effort it seems to take to, to connect with a new person, the more I enjoy the challenge. <laughs> Interesting. So, so I, I probably recognized in early childhood that I was going to find a, a career path that uh, had something to do with communication. I mean, I wasn't thinking when I was eight years old, I'm gonna be on TV one day. But I thought I would maybe be a professor or uh, a minister or uh, a, 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 an attorney, a lawyer. I, I knew I was going to be doing something that involved communication and, and connecting with people. Um, so I think communication 
is uh, whether it's one on one or whether it's what I do for a living every day, is the key to uh, bringing people together who have uh, different views on issues, different worldviews. Um, and th I think that's especially important today in, in our society because we're living in a time of such deep polarization. Um, so politically, I, I tend to like those people who reach across the aisle and try to find common ground, getting back to the, the commonality I was talking about. Sure. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons I still enjoy doing what I do for a living, which is communication. Uh, uh, I'm reporting on a subject that um, that affects people's lives every day. I'm, I'm reporting the weather, uh, and it affects how we choose to dress, <laughs> when we choose to plan travel or recreational uh, activities. Um, but in doing that, in reporting on the weather, I feel that I'm doing much more than just giving a weather report. I, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm there to uh, let people know that even though there may be much in the news that is disturbing and upsetting, that you know there's still a lot to smile about and feel good about. And if I can achieve that every day on the air, then I feel like I'm doing something purposeful. And I think you are, and given this moment of time and where we're going forward with all the 24-hour uh, news, all the TV stations, all the internet and everything, this is a whole new world we've entered into with all this stuff coming through. Yeah. Do you have any views on all this stuff that's happening and how it's impacting us for better or for worse? Well, I tell you, I, I, I don't pretend to be a visionary, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where we're headed, but uh, as much as I appreciate uh, what we can do with with the new technology uh, and with high tech, uh, I worry that um, that people are getting so caught up in in technology and, and in communicating with devices as opposed to interpersonal communication that we're losing social skills, losing communication skills. Uh, I hope that doesn't happen. I, and I. And I I, I don't want to sound like an old fogey who's <laughs> <laughs> taking, you know, who's who's uh, issuing a blanket indictment of of the younger generations that are are more dependent on technology than you and I were growing up. Mm -hmm. But I just hope that as our dependence on technology grows, that we don't lose um, sight of the importance of interpersonal communication, human to human uh, communication. Uh, it's so easy to hide behind. Uh, and an, a veil of anonymity when you're when you're communicating uh, on, on Facebook or Twitter or any of the social media, um, and it, it's easy to, to give into the temptation to uh, say things that you, w you wouldn't say to a person face to face. And I just hope we don't uh, lose our our personhood and our humanity uh, to technology. I can understand that, uh, you know. Uh when we had coffee last week, uh, we live in the same town now, and uh, we're at a small coffee pub, and you walked in to visit with me for an hour, and a and bunch of guys sitting around there uh, who hang out there, and, hey, Spence, uh, what's the weather gonna be like tomorrow? Can you make it rain? And, <laughs> and it was fascinating to see, because you're a TV personality, national, and, but, people like you and you like people and I could see that in that coffee pub. They know who you are and they just love talking with you and you like being with them and that's, so I don't think you've ever lost that personal skill yeah. despite all the electronic stuff you've done in TV. I and, hope not, and, I uh, hope not. That reminds me of a story, I, I'll try to make it quick. Sure. Uh, in my early career as a news reporter in Richmond, Virginia, uh, early 1970s, the, the public schools were still being desegregated and I was covering a landmark desegregation case in the Fourth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, which is based in Richmond. And as I was coming out to get ready to do my little stand-up report that day, there was a group of uh, people out there, angry marchers, demonstrators, against desegregating the schools. They wanted to maintain uh -huh. segregation. So uh, I certainly wouldn't think that anyone in that group would be a fan of mine. And yet one of them who was carrying a sign promoting segregation said, Oh, hi, Spencer. <laughs> I'll watch you every night. <laughs> and I thought, oh, oh my God, how weird is this? <laughs> That's right. As a uh, sort of a final question, uh, young people that uh, have an, might have an interest in journalism or TV, print journalism, TV journalism, anything, 
What advice do you give to young people now who are considering a career like you have, you've had? That, Tom, the best advice I can give is to, uh, to develop intellectual curiosity or to maintain intellectual curiosity. Uh, don't become so enamored with the idea of being recognized and being famous that you lose sight of the purpose of, of being a news person. Um, I, there are lots of people I have encountered in the business, especially in the last 20 years or so, uh, who are more caught up in the mechanics of getting a TV show on the air and getting the, all the visual effects and the graphics and all that. Mm -hmm. And they lose sight of the content and uh, the importance of you know, um, having a knowledge of history and having a knowledge of world affairs, having a knowledge of how the government works. Um, be curious, uh, maintain that intellectual curiosity because a, a broad base of knowledge uh, is a good foundation on which uh, you can build a career as a reporter. Excellent advice and uh, on that, with your book here, You Bet Your Life, when you signed it in front for me, you referenced to me, Tom, to have a purposeful day. Oh, I did. And, <laughs> uh, and today has been a purposeful day purposeful day because you've been here with me and to do this interview and uh, I think uh, you know and I want to tell you that again that I think this book is one of the most important books I've read in a long time wow. it's a small book but you ha you capture the essence of your life the good and the bad and that's what the human experience is like and I want to congratulate you on your courage and and anybody out there who is wondering about things, this is a very good book to read and helps us understand our own lives better. And uh, I think you've gifted us all with this book, uh, Spencer. I appreciate that, Tom. I deeply appreciate that. And uh, as we end this interview, what I like to say too is when you reference Muhammad Ali earlier and that signed uh, document or whatever it was that he gave you when you're leaving Good Morning America, that Spencer, you're the greatest. I think he was right. You're one of the greatest persons I've had a privilege just to sit down and talk with on this show. And I think you're a man of courage. I think you're a man of dignity. And I think we're all gifted to have you in our presence. And thank you for all you've done for all oh, of us. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very I'm much, very Spencer.